Okay, so let's start. We're going to talk uh, some more about scripts, hopefully finish it up today. We've uh, got a new resource available we'll discuss here in class, and that is the website for the course videos, uh, all the recordings that uh, Jeff Melnick and Jeff Weekly uh, have been uh, assisting on. So this massive production effort is now uh, getting exposed online. We have 35 sessions already for chapters uh, one through eight. And you can see here that uh, there's uh, quite a bit of detail. We've got it laid out on a chapter by chapter basis. So you can go through and link each one. We'll continue refining the verbiage on there, but the basic principle will stay the same. Is You've got uh, one, two, three, four or five uh, lectures on each chapter going through node by node uh, example by example, slide set by slide set. So uh, we hope you find this useful. So we are here right now. It's uh, early October 2008 and this should be our last uh, session on scripting and uh, we'll get those caught up over this next week and uh, probably keep caught up uh, adding about one per day as we go forward. Some other uh, schedule uh, ahead looks is I expect we'll have uh, Dr. Byung Hyung Yu at the end of the week on our Friday session and we'll go over how to build an X3D Earth uh, model archive for a section of interest. Okay, so there we are. Let's continue now with the script node. And so where we left off last time was with our example script simple state events and we uh, traced through the logic of that example and how we turn on and off a light bulb and uh, pretty involved example showed how we use the script logic to connect both the push button activity of the switch and the animation of the button up and down and the light turning on and off by changing its color. And that include not only the toggling of state but the setup of the interpolator animation so that the next time through it would interpolate down, the next time through after that it would interpolate up and so forth. So uh, uh, there you go, a pretty Pretty sophisticated script, even though it says simple state events. Okay, now we have another script that we're, that's uh, named script events. And this is a modification of our kelp forest exhibit, Pump House. That good old uh, Pump House that uh, you may recall was uh, designed by uh, David Packard when they first uh, created Monterey Bay Aquarium. Okay. So in this example, uh, which was uh, built by Len Daly, he's taken the pump house, and once again, we've made the housing itself as the clickable object to select the behavior. And uh, that touch sensor then acts as a trigger, which turns on the script response. And the script here is sort of acting as a super interpolator, or a multiple interpolator. It, it continues getting tickled by the time sensor and it will produce multiple translations and rotations over time. Okay. Now for this example, instead of putting the javascript.js file where ECMAScript code is contained, instead of putting that outside in a separate file, we've kept it inside, uh, embedded in the X3D scene. And uh, that means we've got to ensure that we uh, keep our ECMAScript header in there. That's a required part of the syntax. Also, we use the C data character data block to ensure that uh, XML parsing doesn't garble or change or sometimes call mung the different layout of characters in there. And uh, of course, our functionality is still exactly the same whether that source is embedded in the scene in the C data or put outside in a different file. Then uh, finally, uh, uh, inside or outside, 
the same functionality takes place. The X3D event model, where events are passed in the scene, in this case starting with a touch sensor and then going to a time sensor clock, finally arriving at the script, um, that's what governs the overall flow of control and our script is doing computations and sending output events in response to those input events. Okay, so let's take a look. Here is a picture of the scene and we've iconized a number of the uh, geometry in here because it's just not relevant or it would take too many screen snapshots to capture it all. Uh, there are some pieces that are used in here. Uh, for example, you can see the time sensor and a position interpolator there for moving the uh, piston up and down. And we've seen that code before. We've, we've traced through it. It's not particularly pertinent to this example because we don't care so much about the piston going up and down. Instead, we want to see these uh, cones spinning and rotating simultaneously uh, uh, in two different ways as part of this. So where this scene gets more interesting is down here uh, where the control script starts. And that continues on the next scene. So here we have it picked up and we're now going to trace that. On the upper right hand side you see uh, our script node editor is what we get if we want to edit this particular node and uh, actually I think we could probably do a better screen snapshot than this one now that I look at it closely so let's uh, let's see what we can do with that. Here's that editor, and we'll bring up the scene. And so, script events. Here's the scene there. Let's find our script. Here it is, control script. Edit. Okay, so this is a better view. <coughs> of the script because we don't have a URL array for this one. That's kept black, blank. What we do have is uh, ECMAScript source code embedded in here. We can't show all of that, but we can see that the tool itself takes care of the C data and the ECMAScript declarations for us. And all we have to worry about is typing in those values. So maybe we should do something like this. Uh, why don't we make that uh, a whole separate screen? And we'll put that in the slides. So I'll take a picture of that and we'll go back to the slide. And I'll insert a new one. paste it in and that's probably a little bit cleaner more useful than the highly compressed image we had on the previous screen okay so let's uh, trace through the logic of this screen I'll resume at the beginning of the scene so you regain context you can see here uh, script events.x3d remains the name of this and uh, there we go and we've got a few nodes along here that we don't much care about it's this script right here that we uh, really care about and so here is that script exposed and uh, when we look at the logic for this we can see that the touch sensor uh, that is adjacent to the pump house, it is active, is getting routed down here to a Boolean filter.
called touch filter. And then um, that in turn is routed up as the uh, trigger for the time sensor. Okay, so we only want to uh, get the time sensor started when we trigger on a is active true. Okay, so uh, that means as soon as we're selecting it, it's working rather than uh, both selection and deselection. Okay, uh, that was pretty typical. Now the time sensor is driving a scalar interpolator, which is uh, simply going from a value of 0 to 2 pi. As you can see right there, and that's over a time interval of uh, 0 to 1. Okay, and then that scalar interval, scalar interpolator is pushed up to the field where it acts as an input. Input only to the angle method, the angle field that we've defined in this script. Okay, so then as you might suspect, when we have a field name that's an input, what we've learned is you've got to have a corresponding function named angle. And that's documented in the comments, that's evident in the source code itself. So when that value gets routed from the scalar interpolator up here into the angle, well, this is where it appears. Uh, uh, let's draw this a different way. Okay, so our scalar interpolator is sending a value up and that angle value gets pushed in right here as the input to the angle function. Okay, so the syntax takes a little thought but as soon as you get used <coughs> to this it's very straightforward because the pattern is always the same. Now that we have that value we can use it over and over again within the script as part of different calculations, which you can see highlighted here. Does this uh, magenta come through okay on the uh, video? Uh, hopefully that's readable. Uh, and so we do a computation just like that. And, and so our scalar interpolator is driving it with the input. It's also waking it up each time a new value is sent and the script responds by calculating a series of events and outputting them. So let's look at that logic now. He says confidently, uh, let's get, get it woken up again. I might have to turn it off this way. Let's try that. Okay, so let's step through the arrows again. Touch sensor to the Boolean filter to filter the uh, false event out, then the time sensor gets started driving it, and the scalar interpolator outputs a value, and that output value goes up to the angle. Now notice here we could have skipped a node if we wanted to. The time sensor output goes 0 to 1. That's the way it works. The scalar interpolator, we went from 0 to 2 pi. Oh, so through routing values, basically we did a multiplication effect here. We couldn't have skipped that step by simply putting the multiplication into the script itself. But for the logic of it, we wanted to show that you could do this. And sometimes it makes more sense to let your angle generator node, a simple scalar interpolator, produce the scale that you want. Okay, now that we have that input, and as we just saw, the inputs get fed by into the scene on the right hand side for the angle value, then we compute a series of values. Okay, so we uh, had for example a value here uh, that comes in and what we do is we take the cosine of that for the first value in a the triplet, then the sine of that times 1.5 is the second value, then simply 0.5 is the third, 
and we get a new SFX3F. What does that mean? Well, that's going to be our position of the red cone. Lens figured out that little function that as we uh, vary from 0 to 2 pi, we're taking sines or cosines to put it around the coordinates of a circle. So the math of that is pretty straightforward uh, trigonometry. I won't bother driving it here. You can uh, figure it out if you want. The main thing to see here in this example is the data flow. So one after another, we're going to compute each of these positions and then each of these orientations. It's a variation on a theme each time. You can see that once we get one, usually we're just offsetting by uh, a third of 2 pi or 2 thirds of 2 pi. That's what those values are. It's the phase difference so that everything is 120 degrees out and we get three similar values. Given those three, uh, three orientations and three positions getting computed, we push them back out to our output fields. And looks like I'm missing one more red arrow right there. And then given that we have those, then we kick them back up and out into the scene. And you can think of the script then as that field interface where the event outs are sent as output only events and then back into the scene where if we go back up, it's not listed here, but if you trace through the code, you can find out where each of these go. So for example, one of them will go to the red transform and change both its translation and rotation from the initial value to the ongoing value. And of course that was all computed below. So let's take a look at it now. And we'll go into the scene. And here's the scene on the left. So I've got my mouse over, select, and it immediately responds. And if we look closely at this guy, we can see that not only are the cones rotating in a circle, but they're also spinning in place. So if I drag this around just a little bit, so we can get it a little better centered, then you can see that it looks like the circular path for the translation is going like that. Each cone is 120 degrees out from the other one. And then as they get transformed to that place, they each get spun. So the net effect of your behavior looks something like that. OK, so pretty clever. Maybe that matches a pattern that you would want to do someday with another example. There you go. What does it look like uh, on the script? Well, I think uh, we'll replace this box right here. <coughs> Change that with uh, just a little text annotation. Okay, and let's see if I can add a line to this guy. Okay, so there we go. There's our data flow. And we're all done. Okay, so let's look at our next example now. Uh, script complex state of X. Get the slides in the right order here. Okay, script complex state of X. Yeah, sorry, the uh, names on these guys are pretty close. You should probably have figured out better names, but uh, just have to pay a little attention. So this, this script is... Uh, 
as the name implies, a little more complex. Instead of just turning a lamp on and off, it's changing the variation. Uh, then each time we make a little bit of a change, and then a little more of a change, and then more of a change before we repeat the cycle. And so uh, getting more general logic instead of just a Boolean flip-flop is somewhat more complex. But not that bad. It's still the same basic logical pattern in the script. So if you were going to write something like that, I would probably start by writing a simpler version of that first, going from one to the other, is easier than creating the whole logic for a bunch of variations. So this also is illustrating probably a good design practice. Start small, get something small working, and then add features, add functionality with that in mind. Okay. Now, to do this, we do have to keep track of state. So this is another important reason for why a script was needed. The previous example where we were just going from one to another at least conceivably, we could have written that using a Boolean toggle node to remember that value of what was it, let me do the opposite each time. But instead here, we've kept a script variable, a persistent state variable, that we'll use to increment our count so that each time through, we can take a slightly different reaction to how it works. Uh, this time, we uh, used an external file purely coincidental. It could have been embedded, could have been external. I think with longer files, longer ECMAScript files, it's, it's often more convenient to put them externally because then you can take advantage of the syntax checking, the color coding, the code completion features that come with NetBeans and X3D Edit. But uh, once you have it working or once you're satisfied with it, it could always just get dropped right back into the, the scene. Why would you do that? Well, one less file to go over the network, uh, one less file to get garbled or dropped or lost or to be there in the email. Since we can embed source code, script source code in X3D, that's uh, pretty helpful if you want just one standalone file that can go anywhere and still be ready to run when it arrives, wherever that is. Okay, so let's look at it. Once again, we've iconized, uh, uh, hidden a bunch of the functionality in the scene here. So that's a nice editor feature. It lets us focus on the pieces that we want. Once again, we have our script right there, but this time instead of embedding the script code in a C data block, we've listed it. And we've listed it twice, two URLs, <coughs> one the local URL in the same directory, the other the online as a backup for reliability. Okay, if we look at what are our state variables that we've defined, then we've got a Boolean for whether button motion is done. We've got a, another variable that's an integer for what's our push count for how many times have we hit this thing. And then finally we've got one for light color that uh, is how we're indicating the color of the light bulb itself. If uh, you're really into verisimilitude, making it similar to reality, then since this is a light switch, a three-way lamp, you might also expect a light node in there, perhaps a point light or even a spotlight. We didn't put that in. It was intentional because the light nodes are covered in a later chapter. But uh, as we'll learn then, lights uh, affect things that they shine on, not that they shine out of. So if you were to add a light into this scene, this scene would be unchanged. It would still be changing the color of the bulb to reflect whether or not light was being sent out. OK, here's our second file for this example. It's the external script. Script complex, same state events. And um, we can see that it's uh, basically a test statement that shows, uh, uh, that, that takes an input. Once it wakes up, it says, which state am I in? And then gives the corresponding selection. So each of these guys are different output views. You would only get one at a time, and it would toggle through these. And uh, 
I guess we can use a little, before we trace this out, we can use a little vocabulary. Uh, one of my favorite words, uh, eponymous. Do you guys know what eponymous means? No. This is, this is a good conversation stopper if you, you know, uh, if you want to use that. Eponymous is, is like synonymous, uh, but uh, different. Of course, and what the eponymous means is same name, not a similar name or similar sounding or similar meaning, but same name. So by that, this script complex state events.js has the same name as the referring script, which is script complex state events.x3d. Okay, so it's hard to confuse that they have a uh, similar purpose, related purpose, because they have the exact same name with a different extension. So there's your uh, vocabulary word for today, eponymous. Eponymous isn't synonymous to synonymous. Either. No, eponymous is not synonymous with synonymous. Uh, and I'm afraid to keep going down that road. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's look at the logic. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I'll go back one, and not shown on here is an arrow, but uh, maybe it should be, is when this is first triggered, there's a Boolean coming in here that triggers the function, that starts it off. And when you give it a, a, a Boolean, what should this indicate? Well, whether or not the button motion was completed, meaning this animation right here of the button as it gets uh, reset, pressed each time. Okay, once we've given that, we have that triggering event to start the script operation, then let's look at the logic as we proceed through this script. And so the first thing that happens that is that it says, if our value, meaning our input Boolean, if that button motion done event value equals true, then we want to reset the next motion right here, our next motion, to go up. And so where does that next motion go? Well, that is setting up our position interpolator key value array. So this is the same logic that we traced in some detail in the previous example of uh, simple state events. Okay, so that's how we reset our button animation. What else? Well, if it's not button motion down event value true, then it must be false. If our value wasn't true, then <coughs> our value must have been false. In which case, what do we do? Well, we're going to increment our button push count. Okay, and so that's our state variable, our persistent state variable. And so if we look at the logic of this, the plus plus operator means increment by one. Increment button push count by one. So whatever was before, it's now one greater. And then we say, if it got greater than three, then we've completed a cycle and reset it to zero. Okay. So here we're using a loop to force the counting of the button. Uh, button push count will go from zero to three. Zero, then one, then two, then three, then back to zero. We could also use a modulus operator. Often people use that when they have this kind of cyclical counting. We didn't, just use Bruce Force this time. What's next? Given that we've updated our uh, our state variable, then we want to reset our position interpolator. So that's similar to the first arrow in this picture. Then what's next? Uh, depending on our push button count, 0, 1, 2, or 3, we set a different color to the light bulb. Okay, and I put all these four side by side with similar arrows because only one will get 
uh, initiated on any given step. Only one will get executed. And if you look at those color values, you can see that they start from pretty dark gray, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 as an RGB, get brighter and brighter and brighter until we're uh, mostly red and green with a little bit of blue. So another way of thinking of that, red plus green equals yellow. And then when you add the third color, that whitens it up. So it's a light, bright yellow. OK, what are the right values to use? Uh, just experiment with it. You can use the color editor in, in X3D Edit, or just keep uh, editing it and changing it until you get a value that you like. OK, and I think that's it on the trace there. So let's take a look at the logic firsthand. Script complex state events. So when I push the button, uh, now this is tricky. It worked the first time around. No, really, it did. <laughs> 30 minutes ago. Uh, Shoot. Let's try launching it. Try it in two different players, see if we can get one to work here. I did test this in XJ3D right beforehand. OK, so here it is working in standalone mode in XJ3D. There must have been some reinitialization problem when I got back into it. But here we go. And I select each time. I've selected twice now. It's changed twice. So I'll select again, select, 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 select. And if I, uh, instead of just clicking it very fast, if I split the select, deselect, go select, deselect, select, deselect, we can see that it's on the release stroke rather than the selection stroke that this is getting triggered. But looks pretty good. We've got uh, a toggle through the different states. Okay, as long as we have it up, we'll see how Instant Reality did. And it's also triggering on the deselect state, and we're going through all four. Okay, so there's another example, another set of script code that you can uh, tear apart and uh, confirm works. Let's see what's left here. Okay, we've got a few fields that are uh, left to talk about. Uh, when we pass in values to scripts, they might not only be simple events, numeric values or, or integers or booleans, but they might be nodes themselves that we control. So if a script is given control, remote control, you can think of it as another, of another node in the scene, then we need to tell the X3D browser that it might be doing this kind of stuff under the hood. The reason for that is browsers can can optimize themselves so that they're looking for events passed as a cue to, oh, I need to refresh and update this size, side of the scene graph, this sub-scene graph. So uh, in case one of the changes you made had an implication on some other part of the geometry. So direct output is simply an alert to uh, the browser that, hey, this script has uh, got special control. It's reaching in and modifying things. So it lets the author uh, 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 diffuse that optimization and make sure things get carefully updated each time. Okay, but since we're very performance or oriented, we don't force it to that. We give the uh, author a little bit of rope to uh, do the right thing and keep things very fast so that they can indicate when they're updating or not. Okay, another field that uh, is pretty, I'd say considered uh, an advanced field, direct output, and must evaluate. These are for sophisticated advanced scripts 
that are doing uh, special work. So uh, must evaluate is a cue to the browser that if you're resetting multiple events at once, we saw this in our complex script where we were updating three positions and then updating three orientations. It makes sense for those six to get sent at once because we want the whole animation to move in concert as it goes around. But it might be that you wanted incremental updates sent right away in case that's triggering some other screen refresh or some other computation in another script. So this is, again, it's an optimization field. It's for advanced scripting. And you might want to use uh, must evaluate. Typically, we don't worry about that because we don't want the scene to update until the script's done anyway. Right? The script operation has to complete before the redraw cycle occurs. So this is why nine times out of 10, you wouldn't touch it. However, if you had something like database access or networking listeners in your script, then that might be a good cue that you wanted to push those out to other scripts. This would help the browser, say if it was doing parallelized operations, be a little more efficient. Okay, then uh, we've mentioned these before. Uh, we've got a slide here detailing them. The initialize method gets called when we first start up a script. The shutdown method when it's uh, shutting down for things like <laughs> shutting down file connections, uh, file reading, or uh, network, network reading. Okay. Uh, using initialize is also a good way to uh, trace the invocation of your script. So, for example, if your script's not doing what you want, you might want to put some trace statements in there. Uh, so you can trace the, the flow inside the script, look at the console and see those outputs, make sure it's working. Initialize will first tell you if it's getting invoked or not. That lets you isolate. Did I not send an event to my script, which didn't turn it on, or did the script simply fail to load? Okay. Uh, maybe there's a browser problem, maybe there's a syntax problem in your script that kept it from starting. Okay, so this is part of debugging technique. Okay, and we do have a script in here called test script initialization, which simply does that. It has nothing else but an initialized script and prints out a statement so you can see how that works. The top screen shows you what the uh, output looks like, uh, and the second screen shows you what it looks like if it works. Now, uh, this is kind of interesting because we've got it working in two different ways here. One is it prints out to the browser console, and the other is uh, initialize result is getting sent to the text node in the scene here. So if the script initializes properly, then that initial text gets blown away and this new text gets replaced instead. Since initialization occurs before the first frame is rendered, if everything works on this script, you'll never see that guy. In fact, to get that screen printout, I had to intentionally break the script to make sure that it came up. What we would or ordinarily see is just that, which means, yep, all's well, and it worked. Okay, what's left? We have a pretty sophisticated series of examples. These were originally uh, published using Java. Uh, way back in Vermal, Vermal 97 days, uh, but we've translated them also to ECMAScript and they can show uh, details of how things work. And uh, here's the story on these. If scripting fails, you would end up with this first screen. If script initialize is okay, we get the second screen. So in that respect, it's a lot like our previous example. And then uh, uh, if we select to toggle, we get the green screen. So it goes from uh, red to green to blue. And then if we keep clicking and it's still working, it'll just loop through those. 
and you can toggle one, two, three, one, two, three through the red, green, blue screens. Okay, and so these are excellent examples to illustrate how all this works as uh, uh, part of this. Here we go, we've got a figure here, uh, two figures actually. This one illustrates uh, how the event control, if we're passing events, uh, toggles through it. That should be pretty familiar, we've had a few examples. The variation of that is interesting. This shows if we use uh, nodes, if instead of routing values by events, we instead let the script own the text node and own the transform node by passing the nodes themselves as parameters, this lets you modify their fields and look at it. I've taken these uh, uh, figures from the original paper on Vermal and Java. The logic is exactly the same whether we're using Java or ECMAScript. So I recommend those examples to you. Uh, they're embedded in there and this shows you where we get them from. Okay, I think we're just about done with scripts then. What's left? We have two prepare events and events processed. This is if you're getting multiple inputs to a script and you want to make sure they all arrive before you react. It's a good advanced technique. It's described in the chapter. There are a bunch of utility functions that you can use in your ECMAScript. Uh, browser get name, browser get version, etc. Let you print out in your console just what you get. Here are a few more. Create X3D from string or for stream. And also our browser print and there's a browser uh, print line as well. Okay, let's see what's left here. That's it for script. There's our tool tips. It's also it for field, at least for now, how we use field with a script. Our remaining resources are pretty straightforward. If you want to look ahead, there's an interesting proposal on using AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript, in this case for X3D. Uh, this is a common technique in XML land that we're thinking of adopting. It's also an influential paper from many years ago by Greg Seidman. His hot pot was all about uh, automatic type conversion. Some interesting utilities in there you might find uh, uh, useful. Okay, and then our summary, event utilities and scripting. Our event utility nodes are all about flipping values for booleans and timestamps, either as a trigger or as a toggle or as a sequencer. We also can sequence integers as an impulse function and trigger with integers if there's for example, a Boolean or a timestamp trigger, we can turn that into an integer trigger that would always send the same integer value. That was the first half of this chapter. That's plenty of good stuff right there. We also went through ECMAScript, how the script node works with that. Our suggested exercises are uh, build stuff, build your own. Don't just lean on the examples that are in the chapter, but uh, put things together. And when you use scripts, uh, get verbose. Put some print line statements in there to make sure you understand the functionality. Have our regular references, uh, uh, in this case the uh, book, and then the tools and the specification. Always good to read as a, as a second check. There are some uh, very helpful scripts in the Vermal source book. Those have been uh, translated and they're ready for you. As we showed in the video, we've given you a copy of the ECMAScript spec. And there's a great book that uh, I believe you can still get online. Tons of uh, scripting examples in there written by uh, some very prominent, very well-known and uh, capable uh, authors, uh, script authors. Late Night Vermal with Java. Just about everything there is directly either droppable or slightly translatable to match X3D syntax. And there you have it. So we're done with uh, scripting and 
now that you have this, you've got control of one of the most important extensibility mechanisms in X3D. If you don't find the functionality you already want, or if, if you don't find the functionality you want already in X3D, it's likely that you can write your own script to produce that functionality and get the input-output functional change between some events coming in and some events coming out to do what you want. Okay, see you next time.